Hello, and welcome to the Charlotte Association of Corporate Counsel's panel discussion titled Why and How to Police Your Intellectual Property, sponsored by Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick. My name is Patrick Horn, and I am the Intellectual Property Department Administrator at Shoemaker. I'm a registered patent attorney and certified licensing professional with significant litigation experience, having successfully argued before a seven judge judicial panel on multi-district litigation in Los Angeles. But that's enough about me. Uh, joining us for the panel discussion today are three of my colleagues. First, we have Katie Gromlevitz, who is a partner at Shoemaker. As a seasoned trademark portfolio counselor and manager, Katie often represents clients before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board or the TTAB. Katie is certified as a trademark specialist by the North Carolina Bar. This is an honor bestowed to only the creme de la creme of trademark lawyers in our state. Only 27 lawyers statewide have received the trademark specialist distinction. Katie and our trademark portfolio team manage over 3,000 active trademark registrations worldwide. Katie, if you could give a little wave. Christy Trimmer is a Shoemaker partner and chair of the Shoemaker Innovation Committee. She was recently honored by the Business North Carolina as legal elite in intellectual property. This is an honor garnered by only 4% of the state's attorneys. Having managed all phases of federal court IP litigation, Christy has first chair jury trial experience. When not in the courtroom or defending a Zoom deposition, Christy regularly handles trademark disputes before the TTAB, domain disputes under the UDRP, counsels clients on trademark selection and registration, and negotiates technology transactions. Tom Bengera is a shoemaker associate focusing on patent infringement disputes and litigation. Tom hails from New Jersey, having spent his formative legal years training with world-renowned patent infringement litigator, John De Maris. Did I get that right, Tom? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, John De Maris is how he says his name, but uh, there's no wrong pronunciation. Um, and, and Mr. De Maris's IP litigation boutique in New York City. Tom represented some of the world's premier multinational corporations and federal courts in California, Delaware, Texas, Nevada, and all across the country. Tom has extensive experience in all phases of litigation, including briefing and oral arguments related to expedited discovery, technical experts, patent claim construction, and damages, just to name a few. Along with myself and Christy, Tom serves on Shoemaker's versioning, licensing, and technology transactional team. Also, we're very pleased to have our friend, Bergen Hardin, join us on the panel. Bergen is Associate General Counsel for the Boy Scouts of American National Council and is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. At the BSA, Bergen is responsible for all IP matters, including policing and enforcing the BSA's marks, and he is known for providing pragmatic, proactive advice, not only on trademarks, but a wide range of business issues, including commercial transactions, technology, and data privacy being recognized by the International Association of Privacy Professionals as a certified information privacy professional in the United States. Bergen is a Davidson College alum and earned his law degree at Wake Forest. Before we begin the panel, we wanted to get a feel for who is in our audience. Please respond to the survey question on your screen now. At the end of our discussion, I will reserve five minutes for the panel to answer questions. So during this discussion today, please submit your questions via the chat function anytime throughout the presentation. To the extent that we do not get to all of the submitted questions, we'll reach out to you individually with our answers offline. So we're just collecting the final responses now. And I'm going to close the voting and share the results. So here are the results of our survey and it looks like most of the audience is involved in making some intellectual property policing and enforcement decisions in their role as corporate counsel. Uh, with that in mind, I hope everybody takes away some helpful information from this session today. We do have an aggressive agenda to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. Katie, the first question is going to be for you. 
why should trademark owners police their trademarks in general, Katie? Well, Patrick, just like other types of intellectual property, trademarks are not self-policing or self-enforcing. Trademark owners have to proactively police and enforce their marks and even have a duty to enforce their marks. The duty to enforce your trademarks is based on the fact that some of the value of a trademark comes from it being used exclusively by one party or source. If a trademark owner allows or acquiesces others using the same marks, the value and exclusivity is lost. Trademark owners should also police and enforce their marks to prevent consumer confusion. Consumer confusion and trademark infringement in general can lead to lost sales and profit and have a significant impact on the brand value. Trademarks are a unique type of property in that while the right is given to the trademark owner, or the property owner, the purpose of the trademarks is to protect the public or the consumers. Um, the idea behind that being that a consumer can rely on or trust a particular mark to indicate a level of quality of the goods or services. The trademark owner's right to protect its property um, is intertwined with the consumer protection aspect in the policing policies of trademarks. So trademark owners have to police their marks in a couple different ways. First, they have to police unauthorized uses of the mark. This can be counterfeit or unauthorized parties, including even past licensees where the license has expired or terminated. Um, they also have to, trademark owners also have to police confusingly similar uses of a mark. This is really the traditional trademark infringement scenario where you're looking at competitors in the field and whether the consumers are being confused as to the source of the goods or services. Um, the third way that trademark owners need to police their marks is policing the authorized uses by licensees. Trademark owners have to ensure that the uses by the licensees meet the quality control standards of the trademark owner. And in fact, trademark licenses are not even valid unless they contain that policing aspect quality control supervision by the trademark owner. Trademark pol policing is essential for mark and brand strength. It's a responsibility that comes with being a trademark owner, and typically it can be done relatively easily and inexpensively. So the bottom line here is that all trademark owners should be policing their trademarks at some level. So Katie, how should trademark owners police their marks? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> there are so many different ways and tools out there to help trademark owners police their marks. The tools can be utilized either by the trademark owners themselves or by the trademark owners legal counsel. Some of these include um, just general search engine internet searching. This is searching for your mark, possibly with some keywords to see what else is out there. It can be a very valuable tool in finding other uses of the mark and even give insight into whether a mark should be adopted or not beforehand. Um, another tool is USPTO test record searching. While the USPTO isn't exactly user-friendly for search parameters or search queries, the good thing about the USPTO is that all the records are public and it's a good tool to find exact matches for any marks. And you can also search or investigate filings by a particular owner, such as a known competitor. Another tool is domain name searching, um, getting the who is information, for this, you just type in a couple variations of your domain name or your mark, or maybe with some spelling variations or a pluralization, um, phonetic um, variations or similar and see what comes up. You can also, there are various sites that will search all the different extensions, .com, .org, .biz um, for you and let you know if any of those are um, owned or in use. And from there, you can find out the who is information on every single domain name. Um, and find the owner of the domain name, unless of course they're paying for the privacy services, but then at a minimum, you can get the contact information for the registrar and um, you're able to contact the problematic finds if need be. Another tool is just being knowledgeable about the field and the competitors and the competitors' marks. Um, this obviously depends on the size of the field and the number of competitors, but if possible, it's a really valuable tool. If it's a small field, you can search the competitors, USPTO filings, or you can even just go to their website and browse around to get a general idea of their new products or services or marks. Another tool are Google Alerts. These, you can set up Google Alerts for almost anything. Um, you can pick the intervals you wish to be notified of any hits. Um, this is 
You can do this for um, industry news, competitors news. You can do this for your mark. It's free, easy for anyone to do. Google Alerts. Amazon Brand Registry, another tool. This is a tool provided exclusively to trademark owners who have a federal registration on the principal register. But once you're a part of the brand registry, it allows owners to um, broadly police um, or prevent selling of the goods on Amazon with the marked trademark. And um, the, so the trademark owners can be really picky about what's, what's on Amazon or what's not on Amazon. Another tool is making your employees aware of trademarks and how to spot confusion issues or, or relevant marks. And this will, again, depend on the type of business and the size of the field. But the more employees that are aware of trademarks and how they work, the better. It can be very effective as a trademark policing tool. For example, if your in-house brand developers know how to avoid confusingly similar marks or how to spot a confusing mark by competitor, this can be effective trademark policing. If your customer service employees know when someone has contacted your company mistakenly, or if a return or attempted to return products is made to the wrong company or place. Another, um, another thing to be aware of for employees is if a review was left for the wrong company. These can all be instances of actual confusion that can be very helpful in trademark disputes that could have been missed or never discovered if the employees don't know what to look for. Um, another tool, watch services. For those of you that don't know about watch services, there are companies that monitor every single filing of the USPTO, and they alert the trademark owner or the trademark attorney every single time a similar mark is filed. The potential problems can be addressed really early on, and it's helpful to get the lay of the land and really know what's out there, who's in your space, and who's using similar marks. While most big companies use these services, I think they're extremely underutilized, especially given the relatively low expense of the service and the information you get from that service. A watch service can easily prevent um, trademark trial and appeal board, TTAB proceeding, or even litigation if you find the problem and address it early on. The recent Trademark Modernization Act um, makes watch services even more valuable because the act is beefing up procedures for protesting problematic marks during the review phase before a mark even publishes. So they haven't yet elaborated on what those procedures will be, but it will be an opportunity to formally protest registration um, without the need of a T for a TTAB proceeding. And Thank finally, uh, another tool is making the consumers or the public aware of your trademark and give a means to report. What better way to police your marks than have the public do it for you? Um, a well-known example of this is CrossFit. They ask their members and the general public to be on the lookout for unauthorized uses, and they have a way to report it on their website. This, is, this has been hugely successful for them because it's virtually impossible for them to enforce all of the small mom and pops CrossFit-like clubs and organizations across the country. So here, let's take a, take a look at the next slide that shows the CrossFit public leasing page, and there it is. Um, they have the information and uh, email address to report it to if you find a problem. Thanks, Katie. So Bergen, the next question is for you. What do you do at the BSA to protect your marks and what tools do you use? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, well, in terms of sort of regular ongoing monitoring or policing, we use a lot of the same tools that Katie uh, described. Um, we also use public reporting, um, as she was just mentioning, um, which I tend to think of as sort of a more expansive and less precise variation on training your employees to issue spot. Uh, you get some things coming through the uh, public reporting form that uh, really aren't much to take action on, but uh, having a, an interested public out there and business partners helping your po helping police your marks um, is certainly uh, very helpful. Um, in my experience, I've found that a watch, the watch service and Google alerts are very effective and efficient tools. As Katie mentioned, uh, they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, they can be customized or, or targeted to focus on the marks or the product categories or the competitors that you're most concerned about. And they're, they're push notifications that come to you 
so you don't have to dive down every internet rabbit hole out there. Um, also, I, you know, I don't underestimate the value of periodically searching tests, uh, just going out there to the USPTO database and um, searching for your marks and, and your product categories. Uh, once I came across an application for a mark that presented some pretty significant issues for us, uh, just, just doing some sort of uh, regular searching. Um, this pending application uh, hadn't gotten, had gotten past our watch service uh, for whatever reason, and the USPTO examiner uh, was ready to allow it. Uh, but fortunately, we caught it just through the, the test searching. Um, and as a sidebar, I, I'll also point out that uh, you shouldn't rely on the USPTO examiners to police your marks either. Uh, because they uh, they don't always get it right. Um, I, I'll also make one other point. I think it's important, and the tools we've been talking about here, they they help us all kind of look outward and see what others are doing, which is critical, of course, to policing uh, our marks. But I think effectively policing your marks uh, requires a little introspection too. And by that, I mean uh, it's important to look inward and see how your own company is using its own marks uh, and making sure that they're being used properly in advertisements and on your websites, uh, in social media and other external communications. Um, that sort of policing of your own use is, is important um, to maintain the strength of your marks. And I think it's something that in-house counsel is um, is well positioned to do uh, an influence because of how close it is um, to the business. Thanks, Bergen. So we have another poll up. If everyone can review the poll and submit your answers as to which of the tools you use in house. I'll give that just a few seconds to populate. All right, it looks like we've got most of the votes in, so I'm going to share those results. And Katie, do you have any thoughts on the uh, on the results here? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I think this is good news because um, almost everybody is doing something to police their trademarks. And um, of course, the the simplest, most common ones are the ones that people are using the most. Very good. So I'm going to take a quick opportunity to remind everyone, if you have any questions throughout the the uh, discussion today, please submit them via the chat functionality on your app, and we will uh, review those and answer those at the end of the presentation. So my next question is for Christy Trimmer. Christy, how should counsel assess the risk of a potential infringement? What sort of things should counsel consider when they do so? Thanks, Patrick. Um, so oftentimes you see people shoot off a cease and desist letter just kind of as a matter of course, um, more as a CYA that they're policing their marks, but really you need to first assess the issue from both a legal and business perspective. Um, on the legal side, the controlling, controlling issue in any trademark infringement or Lanham Act claim is whether there's a likelihood of confusion, which is determined by looking at several factors. And these are the factors you see on the slide um, at least for the fourth circuit, they can vary somewhat from circuit to circuit, but for the most part, these are the important ones. Um, I'm not going to go through each one, but in doing your assessment, some of the key factors to consider or to talk with your trademark counsel about would be how strong is your mark? Um, you know, is it, is it a mark that's used frequently in your industry um, or similar types uh, of things that are used uh, frequently in the industry that you might see a lot of third-party uses, um, or is it a pretty unique mark? How similar is the infringing mark to your mark? Is it 
Um, have, they, have they taken the mark wholesale or have they used just a portion of it? Have they used the key portion of it? Um, and then the goods and services. Are the goods and services that the infringer or potential infringer uh, is using the mark with, are they similar to your goods and services? Would a customer believe that the potential infringer's goods and services and your goods and services emanate from the same source? Um, I'm going to skip down to number seven, actual confusion, which Katie brought up. Uh, if you're aware of any actual instances of confusion, this is a really key factor. Obviously, likelihood of confusion is trying to gauge the possibility of confusion, confusion which is the very purpose of trademark law is to prevent consumer confusion. So if you see actual confusion, then this is definitely an indication that you should take action. On the business side, you would want to assess the importance of the mark. Is it your company's main dominant mark? Then obviously you would want to do something about it. Is it a side mark or a more of a secondary mark? Is it something that's um, you know on the way out, maybe not being used that much anymore? Um, what's the extent of the alleged infringement? How are they using the mark? Is it possibly a fair use? Are they using it in a descriptive manner to describe your company or your products? Is it negatively affecting your business or your sales? Obviously, if that's the case, then you certainly would want to do something about it. Um, what's the geographic scope of their use? Is it overlapping with where you're using your goods and services or where you're using your mark? And then finally, who's the infringer? Is it a large company with deep pockets that might put up a big fight? Um, or is it more of a whack-a-mole type infringer that's simply going to fold up shop and pop up again? Is it possible that it's an innocent infringer who doesn't even know about your trademark rights and would likely stop if you just sent them a, a polite cease and desist letter? So all of these are considerations in assessing if and how you want to proceed against a potential infringement. Thanks, Christy. So let's turn back to Bergen again. As in-house counsel, Bergen, how do you go about setting your company's enforcement priorities? Thanks, Patrick. That's a great question. And I think Christy uh, really summarized the, the legal analysis and the business considerations that go into that. Um, for me, I think it does start with the likelihood of confusion analysis and you know, the potential damage to, uh, to your brand. Uh, cases where the likelihood is high or the reputational risk is significant, um, those are going to be top enforcement priorities, of course. Uh, and then beyond that, I think there are uh, a lot of factors that can come into play when you're prioritizing enforcement actions, especially um, in terms of the business considerations. I think it, it depends a lot on the company's budget. Uh, their, their internal and external resources that are available to take action, uh, and, and also the company's uh, kind of their, their tolerance for disputes and, and litigation. Uh, and then the relative value of the, the mark at issue to the overall enterprise. Um, where is it positioned in the market? Is it a core mark or sort of a, a peripheral brand? Is it licensed out? Um, if it is core or licensed out, then enforcing that mark uh, might take a higher priority in the interest of protect, protecting uh, the market position or the revenue stream, um, as well as the relationships with your, your licensees, your business partners. I think some of the other factors that Christy touched on are, are really important as well, um, like the, the, the identity of the infringer. Uh, is it a direct competitor with deep pockets or is it an emerging company in your field? Uh, is it just a fan of your brand, someone who has an affinity for your company? Um, infringements by, by competitors and, and upstarts are certainly going to be a higher priority, I think, than, um, uh, than uses by, uh, by fans, if you will. And then another factor is always, you know, is it a legitimate parody or criticism? And then sort of what are the optics of, of enforcement? Um, and, and I think given all of those factors and considerations, I think it's important for in-house counsel to kind of manage the internal expectations when it comes to enforcement 
and kind of coach uh, employees and, and especially senior management on uh, what's legally actionable and, and you know what's practical. Um, you're not going to take action against every unauthorized use of your mark. Uh, you know, none of us have the resources to do that, first of all. And second, second, there are going to be some uses that um, they might make you cringe, for example, a parody or some kind of criticism. Uh, but there may not be a legal remedy for that. It may be permitted uh, by, by law. And so sometimes, you know, discretion is the better part of val valor. Um, and you don't want to risk a public backlash or bringing attention to something that uh, would otherwise just sort of quietly go away in the, um, you know, the fast paced news and, and infotainment uh, cycle that we live in today. So, um, Patrick, I think sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to deliver the message that the best thing to do is nothing. Yeah, that makes sense, Bergen. Okay, I think we have another poll question here. So everyone take a gander at this and let us know what you think. I have gotten uh, a couple of questions coming across for us to handle at the end. So just another quick reminder while we have the poll up, make sure you send your questions in via the, via the application. Okay, looks like we've got enough responses. I'm gonna share these results. And Bergen, I think uh, I think you're going to speak to these results, please. Absolutely. Well, um, I would say to the most of you, uh, bless you. It looks like you are doing uh, doing a lot of work, and you deserve a round of applause and a big box of chocolates from your internal clients for the the work you're doing to police your marks. Uh, it is uh, it's it's a lot of a lot of work, and um, my hat's off to you. Um, with regard to um, the the issue of sort of uh, outsourcing or, or authorizing other departments to um, take uh, to to manage enforcement activity, um, I would just just call out some of the some of the um, consequences to look out for when when doing that, and um, those would be things like um, you know watching out for uh, avoiding declaratory judgment um, uh, actions and, and latches issues. So I think it's it's important to coach those departments who might be helping you manage or or manage your brand policing, helping coach those departments on kind of the proper style and, and substance and timing of their contact with infringers uh, so that uh, you can avoid those uh, you know, avoid potential DJ actions or latches issues down the road if uh, if there's um, litigation. Very good. Thank you very much, Bergen. Chrissy, I think we're going to turn to you for the next question. If we discover a potential infringer, what are the most important considerations in sending a cease and desist letter? Sure, so if you've done your analysis that we just talked about in your assessment then, um, and you've decided to send a cease and desist letter, there are a number of different ways to go about drafting a cease and desist letter and everyone has their own style. Um, sometimes you may want to go a little softer while other times you might want to be take a firmer approach. As Bergen um, talked about, if it's a competitor, if it's a direct competitor um, that obviously knows about you, you're going to take a, a, a more firm stance. Um, if it's a small mom and pop that maybe is more of a fan, um, then you might go a little softer on them. But there are some things that you want to make sure are included in any cease and desist letter um, or that you want to think about before sending the cease and desist letter. And the first is to make sure you have priority. The last thing you want to do is to find out that the alleged infringer has actually been using the mark longer than you have, and now you've put yourself on their radar. So make sure you have priority first and foremost. 
Um, you also want to be aware of the possibility of a declaratory judgment action being filed against you. Um, if you send a strong cease and desist letter and um, you you threaten litigation, then it's possible the alleged infringer could file a DJ action in a court that's more favorable to them. So you want to consider that possibility. Um, if you feel pretty certain that it's going to end up in litigation, then you may decide to file a complaint before sending your your cease, cease and desist letter, or you or you may do that simultaneously. And you could hold off serving. You have 90 days to serve a complaint. Um, so you could file just to kind of preserve your right and pre preserve your venue and then send your cease and desist letter and try to negotiate a settlement before actually serving the complaint. Um, watch your tone. Tone is very important in a cease and desist letter. As I mentioned, um, different circumstances call for different tones. But if you are taking a more friendly tone or a more informal route, then you want to make sure you don't um, inadvertently acquiesce to the infringer or say anything that might undercut a potential willfulness argument down the road if you end up in litigation. Um, I had an instance arise in a case where um, the owner of a company found out about another company that was using a similar, using their mark as a trade name um, in 2008. And you know, it wasn't a trademark use, it was a trade name. So he sent them kind of a friendly letter saying, hey, just so you know, we have the trademark rights in that. So um, just wanted to make you aware of our rights, uh, but good luck with your business. So then by 2016, the other company had expanded their use and uh, they had filed a trademark application. So it ended up in the TTAB and ultimately in district court litigation. And of course that um, earlier cease and desist letter that was sent by the client was an exhibit used for showing an affirmative defense of acquiescence or latches. Um, also, if you, if you send a cease and desist letter, you need to make sure that you're prepared to follow through. Um, anytime you send a cease and desist, you have to be prepared to enforce it. Uh, if you send a cease and desist letter without following through, that could potentially be worse than not sending one at all. And then, as I mentioned, you want to be aware of latches because once you put your infringer on notice, you're also making it record of your knowledge of the defendant, which, which starts the clock running if you ever needed to file a litigation action. Um, so as I mentioned, there's many different styles to cease and desist letters. So we thought we'd take a look at a couple of, of examples. Um, on your screen, um, there is an example by Netflix. I think we're going to start with the video, Patrick. Do you want to play that?
Okay, so sorry for the video quality, um, not the best quality, but um, you know, it's definitely an entertaining cease and desist um, around the same time. So that was in 2017. Obviously, that was Budweiser um, sending a cease and desist to a smaller um, independent brewery who was using their term dilly dilly, um, which Budweiser had recently had that Super Bowl ad with dilly dilly. Um, the the brewery had named one of their, I think, limited runs, run beers, Dilly Dilly. And so um, Budweiser was enforcing its trademark rights, but obviously they took a more friendly approach and offered them Super Bowl tickets. So um, it got their point across, though. It got their point across both to this brewery, um, you know, letting them know that, you know, we own the trademark rights to this. It's not okay to use our trademark. Um, it also, was good publicity for them. It put other potential infringers on notice, any other breweries that might think they could get away with a dilly dilly brew, um, beer. Um, so it it worked and at the same time it made Bud, Budweiser who was, you know, could potentially come off as the big bad guy in all of this. Um, you know, they got, they came off a little more friendly and, and it was good publicity for them. Um, the other example, Patrick has blown up on the screen is is Netflix um, and you can read through it but it was a pop-up shop in New York um, for it was a Stranger Things pop-up bar I think it was also a limited run um, they sent a cease and desist letter that was just you know pretty funny and used a lot of language from the show um, talking about living in the upside down and that the demigorgon is not always as forgiving so again this is just a little more fun um, way obviously most cease and desist letters aren't quite this fun but uh occasionally you might be able to get some some good publicity out of it and and do it in a way that you're maintaining and enforcing your brand so bergen do you have any thoughts on on these cease and desist letters as well yeah i, I would add just how important tone is uh especially in the age of social media it's uh so easy for cease and desist letters and any kind of communication with infringers to uh to be made public um it's i think i i wrote i you know i think you should assume when you're writing that expect your letter to be on facebook or instagram or twitter um, and um, just be mindful of, of that and the tone that you're using and make sure that your communications align with the, the values of the brand. And I think that's an important point. Um, if you're, you've deputized other, other departments to uh, support brand policing to uh, make them mindful of that as well. Thanks, Bergen. Thanks, Christy. So Christy, the next question is actually going back to you. What are some different options for dealing with a potential infringement issue? I know we've talked about the cease and desist letter a little bit, but what else is there? Sure, Patrick. So sometimes a cease and desist letter is enough to get someone to stop infringing your trademark and it is always a good place to start. Um, some informal options and takedown procedures um, might be a possibility such as Amazon brand registry, um, you can file a complaint through Google, eBay's Verified Rights Owner Program or Bureau Program. If there's a federal trademark application that's pending, then the TTAB is a good option. You can file an opposition proceeding, or if the mark is already registered, uh, a cancellation proceeding. As Katie mentioned, the new Trademark Modernization Act is establishing some new procedures that may prove useful to trademark owners. Um, and we should know probably December of this year uh, what those procedures are going to look like um, once the trademark director has established those. Uh, for a web domain that's containing your trademark, the UDRP, which is the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy, may be an option. This is a more streamlined or ADR type proceeding that's typically quicker and more cost effective than a litigation. If you're dealing with infringing goods that are being imported into the U.S. that are bearing an infringing mark, um, you can file a petition with the International Trade Commission, which can lead to having in the infringing goods seized. And this is quicker than usually a quicker process than a litigation. If instituted, it takes about a year before the commission makes a final determination. So they try to wrap it up in a year. 
um, but this is also a very costly proceeding. And then finally, you have uh, district court litigation, which can take years for a final adjudication, especially if you have appeals involved. Um, and the results can include anything from an injunction as well as monetary damages. Uh, but again, that can be a very costly process. Thanks, Christy. So I think we're gonna shift gears here and move to the patent side of things. Tom Mangara is gonna speak to um, to the patent side. Tom, what, what can we do in preparation for policing patents that we own? Uh, sure, Patrick. So uh, the first step in policing uh, patents is really just to keep an accurate and updated spreadsheet of your assets. Uh, so that would include, you know, it could be in Excel, uh, something very simple, and it would just include your issued patents and applications strung together by the application. Uh, I would, of course, recommend uh, doing both U.S. and worldwide patents in the same database, maybe on different sheets, um, as well as a list of any of the licensees uh, for each of those assets, uh, the issued ones, um, and the terms of each, so that you can cross-reference when, when you, if and when you need to. Um, also, uh, key personnel within your organization uh, should probably know where this database lives, and uh, maintaining that database should be a clearly defined role or responsibility for someone within the company, uh, preferably an attorney. Uh, now, an organized database can then be used as a tool to accomplish a few things. Uh, for example, uh, making sure you continue to pay your maintenance fees on your patents, uh, making sure that you're aware of any pending applications uh, so that they do not go uh, abandoned, uh, that you're responding to office actions on time, uh, things like that. Uh, another aspect is uh, keeping track of your inventors and their whereabouts, uh, if at all possible. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how important it is to have an inventor uh, who is friendly in litigation, and the inverse of that is having an inventor in, uh, come litigation who is unfriendly uh, can really sink, uh, can sink a case. I've seen it happen. Uh, another fundamental aspect of uh, policing patents is just simply to mark uh, your product. Uh, there's something called the Patent Marking Statute. Uh, it lives in 35 United States Code, Section 287, and it is designed so that potential infringers can be put on uh, notice of relevant patents, which uh, you know, fundamentally makes sense. Uh, so why is it important to comply with the Patent Marking Statute? Uh, the answer to that question is actually in the text of the statute, the statute itself, which says, uh, quote, in the event of failure, so to mark, no damages shall be recovered by the patentee in an action for infringement, except on proof that the infringer was notified of the infringement and continued to infringe thereafter, in which event damages may be recovered only for infringement occurring after such notice. So the concept being that uh, if you mark your products, the defendant is assumed to be on notice and you don't have any additional proof. Uh, to, sh to make in court that the defendant was on notice of your of your uh, patents. However, if you fail to mark, it is not an insurmountable uh, burden, but you would have to show via other means that the defendant was on notice, which is just not somewhere uh, as a plaintiff. You have enough to prove um, in a patent litigation. You don't want to also have to prove uh, notice if you don't have to. Uh, for certain theories of infringement, specifically uh, indirect infringement and willful infringement, uh, which do require, uh, separate from direct infringement, uh, they require a, a, a knowledge component on behalf of the alleged infringer. Uh, and so failure to mark uh, can be costly, uh, specifically can shrink the damages window, uh, unless, again, the party, the patentee, can prove uh, actual notice by other means. Um, so, for example, if you go back today, uh, you know, members of the audience go back today and you look at your products or services, and it turns out that they are not properly marked, uh, I would strongly consider uh, doing so or you know, uh, putting yourselves in compliance with the patent marking statute. Again, that's 35 uh, USC 287. Um, but uh, again, for a period of time where the product might not have been marked, um, there are other ways to prove notice uh, and, re and to recapture potentially uh, those damages. Uh, one example that Christy was talking about is a notice letter. So a notice letter campaign um, sent or received is uh, is evidence of, of notice of the patent. Uh, at least you've put the other side uh, on notice and if the patent the products were not marked, 
um, the date of the notice letter could serve as the beginning of the, the window for which you might otherwise be entitled to damages, which you would not be entitled to if you had not marked your products and the um, you could not show uh, notice. Uh, one last example, it, it can come in many flavors, uh, is I was involved in a case where uh, a picture of the defendant's uh, CEO at a trade show, uh, a trade show which the plaintiff had also attended, uh, was used to establish notice. The, the theory being that the tables were close enough in proximity and the parties were in the same field, that if the defendant's CEO was at a trade show, he most likely bumped into the table where the plaintiff was sitting um, and the, the plaintiff had brochures at the uh, trade show, which had the, the products and the patent numbers on them, and, and we use that to try uh, to establish notice. Again, all things that are easily avoidable uh, if you comply with the patent marking statute. Um, so Patrick, to summarize, uh, before you begin policing your patents, the two uh, critical first steps are, one, to collect and organize uh, your assets. Uh, you know, I recommend the database, uh, but there are other ways to do it. And then um, you know mark your product, mark your products, and put yourselves in compliance with the uh, patent marking statute. Thanks, Tom. So, is there an effective way to police the market without in-house counsel needing to hire outside help? Patrick, that's a, a great question. Uh, the short answer is uh, absolutely uh, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I would recommend doing as much of this uh, in-house uh, as possible. Uh, the first step is really just to keep tabs on the competition, uh, but uh, specifically with an eye uh, towards patent infringement. So what does that mean? Uh, most companies are already keenly aware uh, of competitors' products, it's, part, it's the nature of business, but it's also important to loop uh, in-house counsel, uh, preferably whoever has IP-related duties, uh, into those conversations. Um, for example, uh, your sales team, uh, they are typically the sort of uh, boots on the ground that likely have the best sense of the latest and greatest in the market, uh, since part of their sales pitch generally is to distinguish uh, your product uh, over the competition. Uh, now, for larger companies, we often see uh, that there are you know trainings on new competitor products, uh, sometimes even a handout or two, a sort of formal training program for reps to get comfortable with selling against uh, new products in the market. Um, this is a great place to get in-house uh, counsel involved or uh, persons within the company who are thinking about IP um, for a few uh, reasons, some of which are obvious. Uh, the first is notice. So we've been talking about notice in litigation um, often uh, in the context of the cease and desist uh, letter or campaign of letters. Uh, now in litigation, as Christy mentioned, um, you can be held to have been on notice of the defendant's product from the moment your sales reps knew about it. And that of course uh, can seem unfair in larger corporations, larger companies, but it's, a, it's the doctrine of agency that your sales reps are agents of the company and what they know uh, can and often is imputed uh, to the company. And I've, I've seen instances where that appears to be unfair in large companies where you know maybe the sales reps are, don't have any uh, patent related responsibilities, but um, you know, the, the, the doctrine of agency is fairly clear and there are ways that defendants can use a sales rep's knowledge to impute, to, uh, to be imputed to the rest of the company with respect to patents. Um, this knowledge by a sales rep can start the clock on answering the question in litigation of, you know, what took you so long as a patentee to investigate uh, potential infringement or uh, take any action if you end up in litigation. Uh, so notice. Uh, the second reason uh, to get in-house counsel involved here has to do with policing what your sales force is saying about the competition, uh, whether it be uh, emails to customers, uh, uh, in pitch materials, uh, handouts, flyers, things like that, or even internal emails that are internal between the sales reps or sales reps and their managers. Uh, you do not want your sales reps saying things or distributing documents uh, that cut against potentially an infringement theory. Um, so, for example, you could have IP counsel or in-house counsel review printed materials, uh, training documents, sales training documents, things like that, uh, and even consider if your you know if your if your um, if your workflow allows it, uh, educating the sales reps on uh, critical patents, uh, what they cover, and how the sales reps can be sensitive to those patents without uh, negatively negatively affecting their sales pitch. Uh, the third reason to keep IP counsel uh, up to speed 
uh, on the competition. And this is sort of, you know, maybe you could call it uh, patent policing uh, level two, uh, is that sometimes you can actually file a continuation patent that adds new claims, but um, not new subject matter, which is, which is different, uh, that can ensnare a competitor's product better than your uh, existing claim. Um, now, Patrick, I see you uh, chomping at the bit. I know that you have actually done this effectively in the past. Uh, I think you even sort of taught me this trick. Um, so I bet you're dying to maybe explain how this might work uh, and share an example with the audience. Uh, sure, yeah, we, we've actually used this strategy successfully in manufacturing, medical devices, um, telecom cases. So basically you, you file your patent application, um, let's say on day one, and then a year or two later, when you get those claims allowed, um, they're going to proceed to issuance soon. And so prior to issuance of that patent, you have to file what's called a continuation application. And you do that so that you can keep your options open down the road. Um, then your original claims issue, and later you might discover a competitor's product that really embodies the essence of your patent disclosure, but maybe the originally issued claims don't, uh, don't read on that competitor's product perfectly. So uh, this is a little bit like threading a needle in terms of how much you can stretch your original disclosure uh, and still overcome any of the cited prior art, but it can definitely be possible to amend your pending continuation claims, uh, specifically tailoring them to capture a competitor's product. Um, remember, these claims are going to trace their priority back to that original case, and so uh, they technically predate the competitor's product. Um, and of course, the new patent, it would expire on the same day as the original patent, uh, but this strategy can be very effective. It means that your patent prosecution counsel has to really be um, working closely with your IP litigation counsel if those are not the same person um, to ensure that this maneuver isn't available to you whenever the, uh, the infringing product is discovered. Um, but I'm going I'm to kick it back to you, Tom. So um, what should we do when we identify a potential patent infringer? What are the steps you would take? Yeah, so um, so first you want to decide if you uh, prefer to license your technology at all or prevent the infringer uh, from competing. So under the patent system, you really are entitled to exclude. The same way you can keep someone out of your house, you don't have to let them in and grant them a license, you can exclude. Uh, and so most of the time uh, we end up in a situation where there there is either litigation or a, an issued license, but you are really as a patentee uh, fully entitled to prefer to exclude others and not grant a license. Um, if you choose to license, then you start to think about, um, I would at least, the long-term strategy. Uh, and that's because the terms, uh, specifically the dollar amount uh, of any license uh, you know, can and will be discoverable in uh, subsequent litigation against uh, the next target or, you know, any other party down the road that ends up in litigation. And uh, in damages related discovery, the dollar amount of a license, meaning how much five years ago you were willing to license your technology for is, you know, as you could believe, a very strong data point uh, for a damages expert to use and sort of anchor his or her uh, opinion to and typically, uh, just because of the nature of litigation, what you're asking for in a lawsuit is much more than what you were willing to receive for licensing your technology a year or two or five years earlier. So if that dollar amount is too, is low, uh, you risk it being an unfavorable data point in litigation down the road. Um, you also have to consider, uh, for example, if you want the license to be exclusive uh, or not. Uh, and that depends on you know, how many other competitors are there in the market uh, and sort of what the incremental value uh, is of, a, of granting uh, exclusivity. Uh, the length of the term you know, obviously is important. Uh, the longer the term of a license, uh, the higher, you know, frankly, the higher the risk that you will regret granting an exclusive license if you do. And then three or four or five years later, if it's a license you can't, uh, you, you can't terminate for non-material breach reasons, uh, you realize that there is another competitor in the market that you would have been able to license to, or some reason that you, you sort of you sort of gave away a sweetheart deal 
on a long uh, exclusive license. So longevity and exclusivity, um, when combined, um, increase the risk that, um, that you could have gotten more money uh, for a license down the road. Uh, now for patents with applications, mul applications in multiple fields, for example, uh, you could consider carving out um, exclusivity, but limited to a particular industry. Um, so that you could allow, actually allow yourself for multiple exclusive licenses. Um, so again, for example, uh, if you patented a widget that um, that is used in, in two different industries, you could grant, uh, you know, just hypothetically, uh, you can uh, a widget that's used in uh, in shoes and on airplanes. Um, you could grant an exclusive license to Nike and a, a second exclusive license to Boeing, assuming that Boeing doesn't make shoes and Nike doesn't make airplanes, and both parties would be happy with that exclusive license, and you could really get the uh, you know double the value out of your out of your asset. Um, uh, I'm running out of time, so Patrick, I will uh, kick it back to you because I know that the audience probably has some great questions, and I think we should wrap it up that way. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tom. So I'm going to um, I'm going to ask this question of Katie Gromlovitz. Um, if a client is having a product manufactured in a foreign country, particularly in China, how do you go about policing that? How um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, one very useful tool that I have used with clients. Um, producing in China is to actually get a Chinese trademark registration, even though you may not be selling your products in China, and then you can register that with customs. What that does, the Chinese customs, the Chinese customs registration, which has to be based on a Chinese trademark, will prevent um, exportation of those goods if it has your trademark on it. So it, it can stop it at the borders. Thanks, Katie. So I've got another audience question here. I'm going I'm to lob this over to Bergen. Bergen, do the same likelihood of confusion and other considerations apply if someone is using a name similar to your mark but not identical? Yes, I think that's uh, that's really at the heart of the likelihood of confusion analysis. Um, uh, an infringement um, can occur even if it's not even if the the subject mark is not identical. If it's uh, close enough or similar enough to your mark that it creates um, a likelihood of confusion, um, then that that's just as actionable as if it was an identical mark. Um, so, so the, the short answer, I think, to that question is, is yes. Thanks, Bergen. So there's another question here that I'm actually going to ask you, Christy, um, which you may not have seen yet. Hopefully we can understand the question. So trademark registrations are by IC, which I guess is international class, which is much broader than a lot of clients' product lines. Can you enforce the trademark against applications on products that your client does not sell or even has an intent to sell? I think I understand. So the international classes, uh, class system is um, really just to make the registration process easier. It's not limiting in terms of your trademark rights. Your trademark rights um, are for goods and services that are similar. Uh, that's the standard under the likelihood of confusion factors. So if the goods and services are similar in the sense that clients might presume or believe that the source of the goods and services are the same as for you. So for example, you may even have related goods and services. Um, if I'm selling staplers and then somebody else is selling um, pens, that's probably not a very good example, but it's, the, it's not the exact same goods and services, and let's say they're not in the same class, but it's likely that someone might assume that someone selling staplers might also sell pens because they're both types of office supplies. Um, and so, but then you have marks like Delta that are used on airplanes and then on faucets and and they've obviously been able to avoid confusion 
Um, so it just depends on how similar the goods and services are. They don't have to be in the same class to be infringing. Great. Thanks, Christy. Thanks also to Katie and Tom and our special guest, Bergen Hardin, today. Thank you to the ACC. Uh, we appreciate you attending our panel discussion on why and how to police your intellectual property. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you very much.